What is up, people? Van from the Vanderbilt Gaming Channel here, bringing you another review video. Today's video is going to be in a game called Salasta Crown of the Magister. Now, I've put in over 200 hours on this game, so I feel at this point I can give you a pretty strong review of Salasta, what type of game it is, and if it's a game you should pick up. Now, in this video, I would like to cover kind of what the game is, a little bit about character creation, combat, a little bit about the story, and then summarize from there. If you're interested in Salasta Crown of the Magister, then go ahead and sub to that channel, click on that notification, because I'm going to be doing an entire playlist on this game and really deep diving into, you know, what are the best classes and race combinations, what are the best feats, what are the best backgrounds to choose, and then even doing a playthrough that kind of shows you where everything is, how to do it, etc. So, with that being said, let's get started. Salasa Crown of the Magister is one of two games that have come out that is based off of the Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition rule set. The other game is Baldur's Gate 3. Now these games are extremely different. The main difference between Salasta Crown of the Magister and Baldur's Gate 3 is which rules they use. So Baldur's Gate 3 has the official licenses from Wizards of the Coast, so they can use content that is published in any Wizards of the Coast books. So Player's Handbook, Tasha's Cauldron, um, Xanathar's Guide, all of those, the subclasses, races, feats, all of those things are fair game for Baldur's Gate 3. For Salasta, Crown of the Magister, that is not the case. They only have the license for the SRD rule set, which is like the system reference rules for 5.1. So a lot of those subclasses, races, feats, etc. are not available in Salasta. So there's a lot of classes, races, etc. that you're not going to see in Salasta. But what's really great about Salasta is there are a bunch of new subclasses, new feats, new backgrounds that are homebrew that are actually a lot of fun to play. And even worth saying, hey, maybe I can get my DM at Tabletop to allow me to use this subclass in our next game. So other than those two differences, the other really important thing between the two is how they play. Salasta is an exact replication of tabletop gameplay. So how the combat works, how the game flows, it's almost as if you took a tabletop D&D 5th edition game and you put it on a PC. So if you play tabletop 5th edition because of the combat and how combat works and how you move your character around and all of that, then Salasta is going to be perfect for you. If you play Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition for the role playing aspect, for how your character develops and how it interacts with the world, then maybe Baldur's Gate 3 is a probably more up your aisle because that's what that game does. It really allows you to, to change the, the vision of other NPCs and be this person and, and create this character. And Salasta does not have that. Salasta is very minimal on the role play and using your skills to change conversations. So there's not a lot there. It's much more based on the combat and the mechanics. So with that being said, let's get into the character creation and talk a little bit about how it works similar to 5th edition rule set. If you don't know anything about 5th edition D&D and you're not sure how to build a character, there's pre-generated ones you can choose from. Otherwise, you would go in and create four new unique characters. Now, the first things first is you have to start with which race you want. And the race is pretty much determines which class you want. You want to try and pick a race and class combination that makes the most sense. And so with this, you get eight different races to choose from in Salasta. And then you can get a ninth if you bought the DLC, which is Primal Calling, and get the half orc unlocked. Otherwise, you have a choice of two different dwarfs, a half elf, a human, two different elf options and two different halfling options. And once you pick your race based on the racials you get, you have certain proficiencies, you get certain attribute pluses and etc. then you want to pick your class. Now Salasta offers seven classes in the base game and two additional classes if you buy the DLC. So the two additional classes are the barbarian and the druid and then you get the seven base classes. So that would be like fighter, wizard, rogue, ranger, paladin, cleric and i think that's all of them or i miss one after that you're going to choose a background similar to your race different backgrounds give you different language proficiencies tool proficiencies etc and then finally you're going to go into rolling your attributes now you can choose to go to the top and actually do a point buy 
You could also do a standard array, which basically picks your attributes for you, or you can do the rolling like I'm doing here. I would recommend rolling because it's just more fun to roll dice for your attributes, and you're gonna get a much more powerful character if you roll dice. You can sit here and continue to roll dice until you get the stats that you want. And then at the bottom, you can either click optimize where it will put the dice that you roll into the right stats, or you can drag them down and put them where you want. It's gonna highlight blue, the stats that it thinks you should put the most, the highest points in based on your class. And then everything else you can kind of dump in however you want. So once you kind of get that all done, you get your class picked out, you get your race picked out, you pick your background, and then you finally roll your attribute points, then it's ready to actually get into the character creation and start building what your character is going to look like. So I'm gonna finalize this here until I get exactly what I'm looking for, drop it down below, and then we're gonna move forward and start building out what my character is gonna look like. So we wanna put this in Intel, we need some dex, we need some constitution, a little bit of strength because you mess up jumps if you don't have some strength, and then we can just fill out the rest. So right here, you have different skills that you have in the game, so there's different interactions. And then finally, you can choose from different languages depending on which race or class you pick, how many languages they get proficient in. And you can also see the different proficiencies you have in weapon options when you start. And because I picked a character that can cast spells, a wizard, then I have to choose the cantrip options that I wanna start with. So there's a, a good amount of cantrips that are in Solasta. Their spell list is pretty robust for a game. And then we can always get into that in another video, all the spells, what's good, what's bad, etc. So we're gonna select our race cantrip, we're gonna select our cantrips that we need, and then we're gonna go ahead and select our level one spells, and then we'll finish up the character creation by building out what our character looks like, giving him a name, her a name, and then moving on to start the game. So we have to do this four separate times, but if you look at the character creation and how it's designed, it flows very much like a character sheet in 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. You always want to kind of figure out which class and race you want to do, your background, all of that. And it's all very intuitive. And if you're not sure what something is, you usually can hover over it and it will give you the, the answer you're looking for. So now we're going to go in and we're going to figure out what our character is supposed to look like. And then we're going to finish our character and be ready to start our campaign. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about combat in Solasta Crown of the Magister. So, in D&D 5th Edition, if you are sneaking or cautious, you can usually get the first attack, and that is called a surprise round. So if you make the first attack on an enemy before they see you, the battle begins and you have a surprise round. So everybody rolls initiative like they would normally in 5th Edition D&D, but because we surprise the enemy, we get to go first, and all of the enemy's turns are skipped. And so as you can see at the top of the bar, we have all of the different people in turn order based on what they rolled on their initiative, and then each one will go one by one. Now you will notice at the bottom of the bar, when it's time to take my turn, there are several options that I have. I have my regular actions, I have my bonus actions, and then I have the ability to end my turn and do some other things like shove, push, and some other actions. So it shows you on a grid how far you can move. So the standard movement for a character in 5th edition D&D is 6 blocks or 30 feet. So very similar here. It puts a nice little blue box grid on where you can move. And then from there it kind of tells you what you have available at the time. Now you also notice there is a ready button that looks like a clock in the middle. You can ready an action like you can in D&D 5th edition where if you don't want to take an attack this round, you can ready an attack so that if something comes into your range, then you will fire off that attack. You can choose to use items that you have in your character, which you can see on this. I have a healing potion that I can use my action to drink a healing potion if need be. And then in addition, you can see at the top of my character's image in the bottom left hand corner, I have three different options of weapon sets. So for some of my characters, I have two different weapon sets. I have a range weapon set and a melee, and then I can choose to swap in between each one of those. Now, similar to fifth and fifth edition rule set, that is considered an interaction. So once you swap weapons, you can only do it one time in that round or in that turn. 
Otherwise, you have to wait until your next turn in order to swap weapons. So you can't swap back and forth as you're trying to figure out what you're doing. So as the turns will go, depending on the lighting, the different range, all of those things, you can then attack the enemy creature. You know that in 5th edition, you get advantage and disadvantage depending on certain circumstances. And so how you can tell lighting is up on the characters that are in the turn order. It will kind of show you a little, almost like a sun. And depending on how that sun is, is what the lighting is. So you can tell if you're going to have disadvantage due to it being dark or it being light. And then again, if you have advantage, you'll watch as every time you make an attack, it rolls the dice at the bottom of the screen. When you put your weapon cursor on the enemy you're trying to attack, if you see a little green plus in a circle, that means you have advantage. If you see a red minus in a circle, that means you have disadvantage. And if you don't see a red or a green, that means you can attack normally. So just watching the combat play out and looking at how clean and simple the interface is, for someone who has never played a fifth edition D&D game, this game is a very good tool to learn how to play the combat, how spells work, how actions and bonus actions work. Because there's a lot of things that you'll learn playing through Solasta that maybe you didn't know on the tabletop game. And so from a sheer interface, ease of use, combat, and just how the gameplay is structured, I would say that this is the one part of Solasta that is leaps and bounds better than even Baldur's Gate 3. This is the epitome of how a 5th edition combat would go. And the benefit that you get from Solasta is they take in consideration three dimension. So not only are you playing on a board, similar to you'd be doing tabletop, but it's a three dimensional board. So you have to take the distance of certain things into consideration as well. So I'm going to stop and let this kind of play out so you can watch through the rest of this combat scene. And then after combat is over, we'll then talk a little bit about the story. And then finally, I'll give you my summary of what I think about Solasta Crown of the Magister from there. Okay, now that we've achieved victory, let's talk a little bit about the story for Solasta Crown of the Magister. So, the story takes place pretty much like any other 5th edition D&D adventure. You and your party meet up in a tavern, and you're there to meet a Lord Karen. Now, this Lord is part of a large council who has hired you to be deputized to go find out what happened to one of their garrisons out in the Badlands. Apparently, the leader of the garrison has not checked in in several weeks, and they're concerned and so they need a new set of adventurers to go check it out. So upon leaving the town, you head out to this garrison, and you realize that they've been actually attacked by this unique creature called Sorax. Upon fleeing from the Sorax and escaping, you get back to town, and you tell the council, and they laugh in your face because Sorax don't exist. You tell them they do, and they want proof. So they ask you to go out and get ahead of a Sorax so that you can get proof. So you go back out, you look at some of the locations that people have found, some, some, some different things, and you get attacked by Sorax. You get one of their heads to bring back to the council. Now, upon doing that, you also find an interesting crown, and this crown has some special powers and abilities, but you're not quite sure what it does, and neither does the council. They have no idea. So they let you keep the crown and figure out what the crown has to do with all that is going on. So that is pretty much the story in a nutshell, is you are trying to figure out how these mystical Sorak creatures and this crown are related and what it means for the current government and the council and everything else. 
So that's pretty much the story in a nutshell. There are a couple side quests. There's a couple NPCs that you can befriend. One is named Arwen Menton, and or Merton, I think. And he's actually voiced by Co Carnage. If you ever follow Co Carnage, you should check out his YouTube. But he does the voices of one of the NPCs, which you can actually bring into your party a little bit later on in the game. So all in all, the story is just okay. It's enough to keep you intrigued and keep you pushing through the content of the game, but it's not so exciting and invigorating that you're going to end this game and go, wow, that was the greatest story and the greatest adventure I have ever played. So with that being said, now that we've covered a little bit about the story, the combat, the character creation, I want to kind of give you my final thoughts on Solasta Crown of the Magister. Now after 200 hours, I might be biased, but there's something about the simplicity of this game that makes it a lot of fun to play. It's very straightforward, everything is very easy to understand, and if you come from 5th edition D&D, this game is going to function really well, and it's going to feel like you're playing 5th edition D&D on a computer game. And then vice versa, if you've wanted to play 5th edition D&D, but you're afraid to go sit down at a cafe with people you don't know because you don't know the game, you pick this game up and you start playing through it, you're going to know how 5th edition D&D works pretty quickly, and when you go and sit at that table with your friends, you're going to really have a good handle of how 5th edition works. So that's what I really like about the game. Now, it's not Baldur's Gate 3. There's not a ton of great graphics. There's not going to be a ton of character interaction and changing the outcome of different interactions and all of that. But just for the simplicity of how the interface works, the combat, and even the replayability by having so many different class and subclass choices, I really enjoy this game. I mean, they have crafting, just like you would in D&D. You can craft some really cool items. They have a lot of spell choices. You have a lot of different gear to choose from, weapon choices, feats. It just really is a lot of fun. And I've been playing Baldur's Gate 3, and currently I can tell you that I have had way more fun playing Celasta Crown of the Magister because it just feels more like a 5th edition D&D game than Baldur's Gate 3 has. Baldur's Gate 3 feels more like a Divinity Original Sin 2 game with D&D mechanics, and this game just feels like you took 5th edition D&D and put it right onto the PC. So if you're a 5th edition D&D lover, you're a tabletop lover, you're a CRPG combat turn-based lover like myself, you'll probably fall in love with this game. If you're looking for a game that has great story, great graphics, great everything, this is made by an indie company it's probably not for you so this is van from the vaniverse gaming channel thanks for watching thanks for listening in. sub if you would like to leave a like leave a comment and uh stay tuned for more salasta content that's going to be coming here in the near future cheers and peace out